I see people are trickling in. So I'm just going to do a quick welcome and say hi, everybody. If you are here for the 2020, 2024 Solutions for Contested Corridors Program Guideline Development Workshop, you are in the right place. We are going to go ahead and let attendees keep joining and start at around 10.03, 10.04. We'll go ahead and start the workshop. Thank you again for joining. Good morning, everybody. I think people are still logging in, but I'm going to go ahead and give it another minute or so because I still see numbers going up. So maybe 1004, 1005, and then we'll go ahead and get started then. Again, if you're here for the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program Guidelines Development Workshop, you're in the right place. Um, I appreciate your patience as we wait for more people to log in, and then we'll go ahead and get started at 1005. All righty, it is 10.05 a.m. Again, good morning and welcome to the 2024 Solutions for Congested Corridors Program Workshop. This is our first individual program workshop and you will hear us refer to the program interchangeably as program and SCCP through the course of this workshop. As a reminder, anytime we state we or us, we are referring to commission staff. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide, Kayla. I am Naveen Habib. I manage this program. I am joined today by Matthew Yasgott. He is the Deputy Director of SB1 Programming to cover today's workshop. We also have several additional members of our team joining us today to help moderate this workshop and discussion. This includes Kayla Giese and Benjamin Williams. In these workshops, we plan to review and amend program guidelines to prepare for the next program cycle, which is cycle four. These guidelines govern how the program will be implemented, 
facilitated and reported on, as well as how funds will be distributed to reimburse agencies for expenditures. All proposed changes to the guidelines will be shared and discussed during these workshops. And with that, let's move on to some housekeeping items. These workshops are intended to be an active discussion, not a lecture, which is exactly why participants are strongly encouraged to use the raise hand or Q&A features to share their thoughts at any time during the workshop. If you plan to make a comment or ask a question, please clearly state your name and your organization's name. And you may raise your hand or add a comment at any point during our presentation, and we will ensure that all the comments are addressed as they are received. If you have multiple questions, which has been known to happen, share them one at a time so that we may address each question in its entirety. We're uh, human, not bots. We will forget sometimes, so we appreciate your patience with us. And finally, as a reminder, your workshop registration link and phone number are unique to you. Please do not share this information with other participants as it duplicates the same attendee and creates confusion for commission staff. I will pause here and see if there are any questions about webinar or workshop logistics. No questions, I mean. Great. I will also take this time to announce that I'm going to launch a little poll here that you can answer or respond to anytime uh, during the course of this workshop. It should have popped up on your screen just now. Feel free to respond to it when you have time or if you want to, you don't have to respond to it if you don't want to. It's just curiosity based about what kinds of attendees we have with us today. Some are new, I'm sure. Some are who. Some are people who've been with us for a long time. So just wanted to know out of curiosity. Uh, on to the next slide, Kayla, please. So workshop agendas are posted up to 10 calendar days in advance of each workshop. Presentations and recordings, including this presentation that you are seeing on your screen right now, are posted after each workshop on the Commission's workshops webpage and the program webpage. We will make recommendations based on the consensus reached throughout roughly two workshops. For timeliness, additional top time on any topic may be limited to ensure all scheduled topics are covered during the allotted time for any given workshop. Similarly, previously covered topics may not be readdressed at subsequent workshops unless determined necessary. Any questions about the workshop format? No questions right now, Naveen. Great, we'll move on to the next slide. So these are the topics we plan to cover during today's workshop. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with a quick program refresher. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Solutions for Congested Corridors program is a competitive program which was established in 2017's landmark legislation, Senate Bill 1. $250 million are appropriated annually from the state highway account to provide funding to regional transportation planning agencies, county transportation commissions, and Caltrans to reduce congestion throughout the state. Projects must be included in comprehensive multimodal corridor plans and regional transportation plans to be eligible to compete for funds. The commission encourages nominating projects that align with the state's climate goals, manage congestion through innovative strategies, include multimodal solutions and advance transportation equity. Please note that the Solutions for Congested Corridors program only funds the construction phase of a capital project. Next slide. Since the first program cycle in 2018, the commission has programmed 26 projects for over $2 billion in program funds, of which $1.3 billion have been allocated as of fiscal year 2022-2023. Here you, uh, on the next slide, you can see high level details about each program cycle since the inception of this program. You may recall the Solutions for Congested Corridors program underwent an extensive guidelines development process in its third cycle which covers fiscal years 2023-24 to 2024-25. I'll pause here for any questions so far. Not seeing any hands raised or written questions at the moment. Great, then we can advance to the next slide. The most notable changes in cycle three included elevating community engagement as an evaluation criterion, as well as expanding upon the accessibility and economic development and job creation and retention criteria to consider equity throughout the project nomination and selection process. We incorporated every climate action plan for transportation infrastructure or CAPTI 
strategy that was identified for the Solutions for Congested Corridors program, including integrating pro-housing principles into the existing efficient land use criterion. And finally, we provided applicants the option to include any public health and climate change adaptation and resilience considerations that were part of the project planning process in their applications. For the 2022 program, the Commission received 24 project nominations, totaling over $1.5 billion in funding requests. Requests continue to exceed program capacity by over a billion dollars each cycle, which demonstrates a great need for projects that address congestion across the state. In the end, the Commission programmed 10 projects for a total of $532.8 million in the 2022 program. The program projects will provide a diverse array of benefits and best demonstrated a shift away from single occupancy vehicle solutions while reducing congestion and increasing throughput in California's highly traveled and congested corridors. Notably, projects programmed in the third cycle heavily promoted travel alternatives to single occupancy motor vehicles. Over 70% of the recommended funding was for projects that support active transportation, transit, and rail improvements that in turn support interregional and interstate connectivity through an integrated statewide multimodal transportation network. I will pause here for any questions or comments. No questions right now. Okay, then on to the next slide. Through the iterative process of developing the last program cycle, we learned several lessons along the way, thanks in large part to you, our program partners, participants, and stakeholders. Consequently, we were able to increase clarity and transparency in our guidelines and the guidelines development process. Our guidelines offered great accessibility and flexibility in the types of projects that were available and eligible for funding and allowed applicants to tell their project story where all elements could shine. We advanced equity and community engagement in our guidelines and project development processes. We made ourselves available for one-on-one -on -one project discussions during virtual office hours and provided technical guidance throughout the program development process. This resulted in a more diverse array of community and climate resiliency focused projects. That said, we can always continue to improve and we look forward to learning and growing alongside you this cycle as well. If you feel comfortable doing so, would anyone like to share lessons their organization has learned from the past cycles or share any advice or tips that would help new or potential applicants that are interested in competing in this cycle? I'll hold to see if anybody has any comments. Not seeing any well, hands raised at the moment, Naveen, and no written questions or comments. There are so many of us here today. Nobody has any thoughts they'd like to share. I promise I'm not trying to bully you into saying something. If you don't have anything, that's totally fine. Feel free to chime in later on um, if you think of something you'd like to add. Um, but yeah, this is a discussion, so feel free to raise your hand or type in a question or comment into the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. All right, we'll move on to the next slide, Kayla. Naveen, I actually see a hand raised. Ah, excellent. <laughs> um, Kenny Cow, hopefully you are unmuted. I am, thank okay. you. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, well, since Naveen, you, you had asked um, for a prompt, I can just say I really appreciate um, you and the rest of the SP1 team for holding these virtual office hours in the past, and I know you'll continue to do that um, for this cycle. I think they've been really helpful to kind of help um, understand kind of it matching our application um, to kind of your expectations and, you know, answer any questions that we may have. So I, I did want to say that that they've been great and I want to appreciate and thank you all for, for that and continuing to do that. That's it. Thank you so much, Kenny. We really appreciate your comments. And like Kenny said, the virtual office hours, we started them last cycle and they were a pretty big hit with all of you. Um, we've heard positive feedback about those virtual office hours and that's why they're back again this year. Um, we will dive a little bit more into those details later during this workshop, but thank you so much for saying something, Kenny. I really appreciate it. 
Okay, Naveen, we did receive a written question. So this is from Ruben Hoyos. Can an agency apply to fund rail projects as building for more rail infrastructure reduces congestion? Example is LOSAN. Yes. Um, so LOSAN has actually competed in SCCP before. We rail projects are eligible in the in the program. And we do invite you to office hours, the virtual office hours, if you have a specific project that you would like to discuss. Um, and if you have any specific questions related to that project, we don't typically address um, specific projects for each agency during the workshop um, because it takes up time away from the guidelines development process. But yes, the short answer is yes. And I invite you to the virtual office hours to discuss it a little bit further. Uh, we'd love to hear about your project. Okay, Naveen, one more written question just popped up from Sonia Babayan. Start the project identification early on, and if you don't have an adopted CMCP, initiate its development. It is a lengthy and time-consuming process. That is a great comment, Sona, um, and very helpful as well. I will not take away from your comment at all. It's good in its, in its entirety, so yes. Um, if folks are following around, uh, following along and reading the questions that are being answered, um, I recommend bookmarking Sonas because that's a really good comment. I don't see any more right now, Naveen. Okay, great. So I will move on to the next slide. Thanks all. Um, and feel free to continue chiming in with questions and comments as we go through it. I'm happy to pause um, or take questions anytime during this whole presentation. So on this slide, the upcoming program cycle, which is cycle four, will be a two-year program spanning fiscal years 2025-26 and 2026-27. In addition to clarifying edits, reinforcing program requirements, there will be greater consideration on workforce development, continued inclusion of medium-term climate action plan for transportation infrastructure or CAPTI strategies, and we will continue to advance equity in our program guidelines to ensure we keep pace with community needs and consider equity throughout the project development, nomination, and selection process. To this end, we will host at least one standalone workshop specifically to discuss the evolution and advancement of equity and community engagement criteria for all SB1 competitive programs in the coming months. In the next slide, you will see the proposed timeline for cycle four. Please note that this timeline is tentative and may be subject to change. If there are any changes, we will notify you as soon as possible through email and uh, by noticing it on the commission's website. Um, as you can see in the timeline, hopefully you can see it and it's clear. If not, I'm happy to talk you through it. Um, we are going through SCCP workshops for the 2024 cycle, which is cycle four during winter and spring of this year. Spring 2024, we will start to open the 2024 SCCP office hours. In summer of this year, um, guidelines adoption and call for projects. And fall and winter of this year, we will have project nominations will be due. And then in summer of 2025 is when we will adopt the Cycle 4 program. I'll pause here for any questions about anything I've shared so far. Hi, Naveen. Yes, we received one question from Marcella Renzi. Is the commission open to a longer program period, three or four years? So Marcella, uh, if you don't mind waiting for just one second, Kayla, could we go back a couple of slides to the cycle one, two, three, the little drop down as one of the first, um, that one. Yes, thank you. So Marcella, great question. I want us to focus on this slide really quickly. In cycle one, we had a four-year program period which spanned fiscal years 2017, 2018, all the way to 2020, 2021. And we had $1 billion available in program funds. We, pro we programmed nine projects, which programmed is what we call awarding a project um, with a total project cost of $3.5 billion. We've done it before. Um, it has worked, but I think the commission switched to two-year programs when I started. Um, and at this time, I would ask Matthew to maybe chime in and about the reason for why we moved from a four-year program period to a two-year program period, um, because he's my historical guide on these things. Yeah, thanks, Naveen. And Marcella, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the comment. Um, 
I mean, if, I, if I'm being honest, uh, I, I see value in having shorter program periods as well as longer program periods. But ultimately, the reason we went to two year program periods was in case uh, there were shifts in policy that the commission need to um, pivot towards. And so, as you all know, we had CAPTI, which came out uh, the summer that we were um I believe the summer before we were adopting guidelines, uh, so the summer before we started our cycle three guidelines development, and that you know brought up about some important changes to this program. And it was an executive decision at that point that we would move forward with two year program periods and in, in perpetuity for the purpose of ensuring that the programs were staying relevant and current with any policy changes or directions that either the administration or the legislature might take. Uh, I'm not anticipating uh, or I'm just not aware of any major policy changes that might occur over the next two years, um, but we certainly wouldn't want to find ourselves in a situation where we adopt a four-year program period um, and then there's a major policy shift uh, in the middle that might uh, require us to go back and you know, reprogram funds after the fact. So I guess the, the simple answer is a two-year program period keeps us nimble. Um, and flexible. However, I will absolutely take that comment back. Um, you know, we have a new executive leadership and, and some new commissioners, so maybe that's something that can be considered because I understand uh, it's it's much easier to deliver large projects when uh, there's a longer program period because we have a bit more funding to program at once. Um, you know, I can't uh, I can't say that 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 that's going to shift for cycle four, uh, but but I will take the comment back. I, I do appreciate it. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Marcella, I hope that answers your question. Let me know if you have a follow up. Um, feel free to chime in, raise your hand or just respond back in the Q&A section. And Kayla, if we could go back to slide 12, the timeline. Um, before we move on from here, I just wanted to confirm nobody had any questions about the timeline. Um, we do have a, a couple, Naveen, that are coming in. Um, first, Marcella said that we did answer her question. Um, so next is a question from Eric Thornson. When you say fall or winter deadline for applications, are we talking closer to October or January? Good question, Eric. So. Typically, that means November, December to allow participants or interested applicants as much time as possible to pull together their applications. Um, like I said, guidelines adoption is summer, so that usually means June of 2024. So June to November or December allows for the maximum amount of time to pull together an application um, and, you know, ask us any questions during during that time as well. So um Hopefully that answers your question. We don't typically accept applications in January. Um, at least I'm not familiar with any time that we have done that. But yeah, typically November, December. I'll leave that there. Hannah, I see your question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Naveen. That was the last one I was going to read. Great. So Hannah Chanchlani is asking, are CMCP guidelines being developed as well? The last update to CMCP guidelines was 2018. I'm so glad you asked, Hannah. You prompted us for CMCP at the kickoff workshop too. I remember you. So um, great segue into the next slide. I would like to introduce Associate Deputy Director Bridget Driller from the Commission's planning team to discuss the topic, which is so near and dear to all of our hearts, the Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plans, which we affectionately refer to as CMCPs, so that we may not run out of breath every time we talk about them. Bridget is an exceptional and indispensable part of our team, and we are happy to have her here with us today to address CMCPs. Uh, this is all yours, Bridget, take it away. Well, thank you, Naveen, for that intro. And I have to echo Naveen in saying um, it's great to kind of hear all of the enthusiasm and interest for corridor planning. Um, so, uh, Kayla, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and I'll just provide a little bit of um, brief background into uh, what CMCPs are and how they fit into the Congested Corridors Program. Um, 
And so when the Congested Quarters Program was established in SB1, the legislation actually um, required that projects in order to compete for congested corridors funding be part of a comprehensive corridor plan. Um, and so uh, the commission then um, in interpreting what a comprehensive corridor plan um, was developed um, guidelines for CMCPs, um, which you can see um, on your screen here. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and just to kind of, um, uh, just to let you know, we use the term CMCP corridor plan um, interchangeably, um, but um, just to expand on this slide here, um, in the last cycle of the congested corridors program, um, we added a new requirement that applicants submit a self-certification form with our nomination to um, certify that the corridor plan that they are submitting with their nomination um, is consistent with the commission's 2018 CMCP guidelines. Uh, next slide. Okay. And then turning our attention to the current cycle, um, we're, we are proposing to use the same general approach that we used in cycle three of requiring the self-certification form. Um, you can anticipate in the future um, minor clarifying updates to that self-certification form. Um, if you were familiar with it in the last cycle, it's kind of formatted as a checklist. And so we're going through to see, you know, if there's things that we can take off that checklist and if there's anything that needs to be added. Um, but in general, you can anticipate something that looks pretty similar to what was used in cycle three. Next slide. All right. Um, and Kena asked about CMCP guidelines development, and um, I do have an update on this point. Um, and uh, it is true that we haven't updated those guidelines since 2018. So they, um, they are in need of a, uh, a refresher. And we are planning to update those guidelines this calendar year. Um, we are not anticipating any major updates to the guidelines, um, but really, um, kind of the number one thing we are hoping to do is to update the um, the resources that you all can use in your quarter planning efforts. Um, and for example, I know that Caltrans has um, produced a lot of um, guidance on corridor planning in the last couple of years. So we want to make sure that our guidelines are referencing all of the best available resources um, so that you can have access to those. Um, let's see, uh, I do want to highlight the point here that's on the slide. Um, in updating those guidelines, they will not apply to cycle four. Um, as uh, was referenced earlier, CMCPs do take a good chunk of time to develop. Um, and we know you all are not uh, magicians. Um, and so we, um, we'll be applying those updated guidelines to cycle five and beyond. Next slide. All right. And so this is our proposed um, timeline for updating uh, the CMCP guidelines. You can see it kind of um, transposed on top of the congested quarters program um, timeline. And I'll just highlight a couple of points here. Um, the first is that we're planning to do um, some engagement for the CMCP guidelines um, in the summer. Um, we list uh, workshops here. Um, my guess is that we'll probably only need one or two workshops um, since we're not doing a major overhaul of the CMCP guidelines. Um, but you can kind of tentatively prepare that there will be an engagement opportunity starting um, in the summer of this year. And then our goal is to adopt the CMCP guidelines by the end of the calendar year. 
um, and we um, will have a uh, an opportunity for public comment um, when we circulate a draft of those updated guidelines. Um, next slide. Okay, um, and this is my final slide, um, and then I'll pause for questions. But I wanted to try to preempt some questions that we um, frequently receive um, on the CMC keys. So I'll go through um, these briefly. So first, um, we recognize that um, you know some quarter plans will still be draft at the time that um, nominations are submitted. That is totally fine. Um, our requirement is just that those um, plans be adopted prior to program adoption. And so if you do have a plan that's in draft at the time of um, submitting your nomination, we just ask that when you fill out that self-certification form, you're filling it out for the draft plan. Um, and you know we understand that some of the page numbers and things that you reference might change when you go from draft to final. Um, I've been asked uh, if it matters what a quarter plan's title is, if it needs to be called a quarter plan or if it can be a quarter strategy. Um, that is up to you. Um, really what we care about is just that it's consistent with the CMCP guidelines. Um, next, um, does the self-certification form need to be reviewed or approved in advance by commission staff before submitting nomination? Um, no, it doesn't. We'll do our full review um, you know, when uh, staff is evaluating the nominations we receive. Um, but certainly if you have questions about the self-certification form, um, you can um, ask those to Naveen or myself um, prior to uh, nominations being two. And lastly, um, there's a question that we get sometimes about how often those corridor plans should be updated. Um, we, uh, that is up to your agency. What we recommend is just that every four to five years, you take a, a look at your plan, review it, see if it's still, um, accurate, see if it includes all of the projects that you are considering for that corridor, um, and then make your own determination if a full update to the plan might be needed, if an addendum might be needed, or if the plan is sufficient um, as it stands. Um, and that is the end of my content here, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Bridget. We do have a hand raised. Um, Louis Sal, hopefully you can unmute and talk now. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yeah, go can ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? That's the question. Sorry, I, I, I can't hear you, but... Um... I, I do have a clarifying question, and it was in relation to the previous two um, slides. So the, this slide that's shown right now says that um, we we have discretion to determine if we need to reevaluate our plans. And the previous slide says that anything in cycle five will have to follow the 2024 CMCP guidelines. I'm, I'm so our plans that are under the 2018 that have been updated within that five year period still okay? Or is there an expectation that any plans that go into cycle five and beyond will have to be under the 2024 CMCP guidelines? Yeah, thanks for the question, Lewis. I hope you can hear my response. Um, if not, I can follow up with you offline. Um, I think, and, and Kayla, maybe you could go back to the previous slide where we talk about the, and actually it's one one more previous, perfect. So. Um, when we say the guidelines will apply to a current cycle, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the plan that's being submitted um, needs to have been uh, prepared um, uh, with those guidelines because of some of the timing issues that Lewis brought up. I think what we're looking for is that um, 
is that there is a an alignment um, and um, we can work with you with some of those timing questions, um, but we're not in, we're not expecting that an agency is going to um, refresh all of its planning documents once the 2024 CMCP guidelines are adopted. Um, but more so, like as new plans are being initiated or plans are being updated, they will um, they will uh, apply or th they will um, align with the latest guidelines and also when we are updating our own um, self-certification forms and guidance in the congested corridors program, we'll be aligning to those latest guidelines. So I hope that answers your question. I feel like yeah. I was, okay. Yeah, I, I actually can hear you now. So I, I thank you okay. for that. We, I just, um, we needed clarification because in the transition from the hybrid, mm -hmm. there was like a hybrid uh, period that we were, we were allowed to do hybrid CMCPs. We went out and just did an update to, to be, uh, in compliant with the um, the current guidelines, mm -hmm. um, and we just want to make sure that that's something that either we don't have to do or or we can we we might have to do. Um, it was a costly effort. We we wanted to make sure that we um, had some pretty extensive public participation, um, current public participation, and mm -hmm. it was it was a costly effort to do that. And that's something I, I just want to make sure that um, everyone's aware. Uh, on the other side, I. I really want to thank you for having a checklist. It was extremely helpful okay. for us as we we're preparing our update because it gave us the ability to talk to consultants and contractors on what needs to be done and what was missing in our hybrid plan. So thank you for that. Oh, good. I'm glad that was helpful. Okay, Bridget, we do have one written question that came in. Um, this is from Momoko to McCoy. Can the state rail plan be considered as CMCP? Uh, yes, Momo, thank you for that question. Um, this is a topic that actually came up in our last cycle. Um, so uh, commission staff did um, review the rail plan to see um, you know, if it would qualify as a CMCP um, per the CMCP guidelines. And um, as the um, the latest version of the draft rail plan that I've seen as it currently stands, I think doesn't quite meet all of the um, kind of requirements and key elements that we have for a corridor plan in our guidelines. So um, we're happy to continue that conversation. It certainly you know, would be something very new for the program um, as most of the plans that are submitted are specific to a particular corridor um, and um, kind of have a more standardized format. So at this time, the rail plan does not qualify as a CMCP. Um, but I, you know, never say never if the if that could change in the future. Thanks, Bridget. Um, we do have one more hand raised. Sana, hopefully you can speak now. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hi everyone. Thank you, Sana Babayan, LA Metro. And um, thank you for um, uh, the previous slide. Actually, I had a couple of questions and some of them were answered, but I want to reiterate. So uh, LA Metro is currently uh, developing um, Long Beach East LA Corridor Mobility Investment Plan that went to, uh, was released to public for public comment period um, on um, January 31st. So uh, as you said, the title doesn't matter and we don't need to incorporate uh, the lengthy CMCP in the title and maybe a Long Beach East LA Corridor Mobility Investment Plan would suffice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very lengthy document. So in the background, we are mentioning that this document also fulfills the requirements of the qualifying CMCP. Um, and um, I was wondering whether it will be easier for you to see um, at the beginning, um, like uh, maybe pages or some information, how the plan qualifies per Streets and Highways Code 2391, 2394, what are the key elements that qualify for a CMCP, whether um, it complies with the CMCP goals or uh, it's okay with you uh, to read through the document itself and of course the self-certification form and to identify um, the areas where uh, this investment plan also qualifies as a CMCP. Um, what would be your preference uh, with regards to entire um, you know, plan um, 
uh, inter interface level, I would say, so that um, it's clear that it's a it's an investment plan and a qualifying CMCP at the same time. Thank you. Sure. So um, let's see for. Um... So for the plan that you're developing, um, we don't need to see a section in, in the plan articulating you know, why it qualifies as a CMCP. Um, you can do that at your discretion. Um, the thing that we really care about is that self-certification form. And when um, you're referencing specific page numbers, um, that it's easy for us as staff to find um, the information. Um, and so, so long as that self-certification form is filled out completely and accurately, um, that's all that we need to, um, to kind of verify that what you're submitting um, is a CMCP, um, you know, according to our program and guidelines. Thank you. Uh -huh. And I just want to add to Bridget's comment, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of these like clarifying and formatting consistencies a little bit later in this workshop and in upcoming workshops uh, when we discuss proposed updates to the guidelines with, with the actual language of the guidelines available for you to see. Um, and that I'm so glad Bridget brought up the page number thing in self-certification self forms because those, uh, those CMCPs are kind of huge. And um, we love that they were submitted in accordance with the guidelines and that they were available. But I think one of the challenges was that it would say a page number or it wouldn't have any page number. And we knew the information was in the plan. It was just not easy to find or locate. Um, and I do encourage people to use the page numbers and provide a link to something if they have links available, because it does help our planning team a lot. Our planning team is very teeny tiny. Um, and they do a lot of incredible work at the commission. And so they they went on a little hunting expedition in some of those plans mm -hmm. to find the information, which was really great of them. But it could save that extra effort if you just include the page number because you're more familiar with the plans than we are when they are submitted with the nominations. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. Any other questions about CMCPs, um, the guidelines, or just CMCPs generally? Bridget is here. Bridget knows all the things about all the CMCPs. So this is a great time to ask her any questions. Um, if you think of anything later on and that you can't think of right now, feel free to send me the question. I'd be happy to loop Bridget in and we can always invite Bridget back to another workshop as a panelist and guest speaker if that's needed. Yeah, and I'll just mention, um, I'll stay on the line for this workshop if anything comes up and certainly um, you know, folks are welcome to reach out to me or Naveen afterward if they wanna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yes, absolutely. And seeing no questions or hands raised, I think Kayla, we can move on to this slide, this very beautiful, colorful slide that I made just for all of our stakeholders, and I hope you appreciate it because it's very colorful. As I said before, this process relies heavily on the discussions and feedback we engage in with you, our partners, and our stakeholders. In the last cycle, we had the distinct privilege of engaging in discussions with several of you during the workshops, virtual office hours, and the debrief sessions where you shared your thoughts on how we can improve the next program cycle which is this cycle, cycle four. So common among the themes for suggestions were to reduce redundancy and criteria response requirements. You felt that the questions were too similar, um, which resulted in duplicative or run-on responses throughout the application. And as one of you noted, um, it ate up your word count for the application itself. And we don't want to do that. So we'll be looking into that for you. You requested we include examples of projects or strategies for reference. We do this under some criteria, but not all. And we will certainly explore how we can be helpful here and provide um, examples or sample strategies that you can reference, just like we do in some of the other criteria. You wanted us to streamline the nomination requirements in Appendix A, specifically the project application format so that you could organize your applications better without too much repetition or redundancies. I understand many of you had to create appendices and refer back to it in your application. And with all that you've got going on, it can get confusing. So 
I will work on figuring out a little bit of a format to help guide your organization for your applications a little bit better. And finally, you ask that we try to limit major overhauls or changes to the program guidelines to alternate cycles, as this would allow agencies to adjust to the changes and also help set a baseline to measure progress with newer requirements. This is a very fair um, and very popular feedback that we received from last cycle. Um, I heard it time and time again, and I understand it's definitely more of an issue for agencies who are maybe smaller or more impacted. Several of you have people coming in, retiring. So there's a lot going on with you, just like there is with us. And we we want to be able to meet you where you're at. And so I think these are all really great suggestions and we'll do our best to accommodate uh, all of these requests as best as we can. But I would also take this moment to open this section up for a larger discussion. If anybody wants to share any additional feedback uh, beyond what you see here and what I've been discussing with you so far. If there's anything that I missed or maybe you disagree with some of the feedback or anything like that, just feel free to chime in in the Q&A or raise your hand and we'd be happy to hear from you. I know you're not a shy bunch. I know you want to say something. Let's hear it. Hi, Naveen. I see that Sana has her hand raised again. Great. Uh, just one comment. Uh, I, I noticed that for the previous cycle, uh, nominated projects had also a link for project fact sheet. And I think those are very helpful uh, not to look at only your um, uh, agency's uh, projects that have been awarded successfully but also instead of just looking at the title of other projects in other uh, developed by other agencies, uh, just to have a quick, you know, um, quick view of what the project is about and uh, what are the elements. So it was very helpful. Thank you. I hope uh, moving forward that um, fact sheets uh, and the links will be available for future cycles as well. Yeah, absolutely, Sona. That was a great comment. Thank you so much for, for speaking up. And um, fact sheets are popular. They uh, have been popular since our first cycle, and you will see that they have improved with each subsequent cycle. Um, our participants are very talented with fact sheets. They can fit in a lot of information on that one tiny page. And I I will say, as somebody who review has to review so many different applications, the fact sheets do come in handy when you're just trying to catalog them, or if you want to quickly refer back to a project, um, or if you want to share information with anybody in the public who's requested information. It's just really nice to be able to have that like one pager to refer back to. So um, it gives you a good idea, like high level idea of what the project is about. And then you can really dive in to the application itself for those deeper de details. Um, thanks for that comment, Sona. Great. I'm glad you like the fact sheets. Any other comments or questions? I, I swear it doesn't always have to be positive. If you, you have deltas or changes or things you think we can improve, or you just want to complain or whine about something, I am totally here for you to listen to it. So Feel free to chime in now. I, I don't want to bully anybody into saying something if they if they, if they don't want to, but um, this is, the workshop is for you to share your feedback and your thoughts. And um, if you don't have anything right now, then feel free to chime in later at the end of the workshop or even after the workshop, whatever is most comfortable. Um, so now I still see your uh, hand raised. Did you have any additional comments? Uh, my apologies, it was from previous question. Sorry. Oh, no problem at all. No apologies necessary. Thank you. Any other questions or hands raised? Yeah, I see a hand raised, Naveen. Um, Sutha, Suthahar, you should be able to speak now. Hey, thank you, Kayla. Uh, Naveen, one just question is, I know this is a workshop. I'm sorry, so that's that from Caltrans District 3. Uh, so would you be able to share the the scoring criteria as, as you are developing the guidelines? Because that way it'll be easier for the teams to put together the packet the way that you expect. So we that's a good question. So that thank you so much for raising your hand and and asking it. Um Scoring criteria. So that's a good question because one, we always address this at the start of most of our workshops. 
we don't have a one-to-one -one point system um, in the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. The criteria come with uh, guiding questions that are included and typically your applications are evaluated based on how well you demonstrate or illustrate the response to those questions. And it's, it's more qualitative than it is quantitative and it's based on the policy guidelines themselves. I think what I can do, um, because it seems like you might have more specific questions, is I do invite you to participate in our virtual office hour sessions. Maybe I could understand a little bit better about um, what your needs are and help you kind of relate that back to any project or projects that you're looking at nominating. And uh, we could talk about it a little bit further, but but that's typically how our evaluation process runs. Sure, we will coordinate that one with our headquarters SB1 team and you, thank you. Yeah, no problem at all. Naveen, I see that Sana's hand is raised again. Sorry, okay. thank you. I, I'm not sure if I I need to ask this question now or later on, but maybe I can ask now. So with regards to the funds being allocated only for the construction phase of the project, the guidelines identify the difference between design build and design build uh, delivery methods. And the major difference for them, per guidelines, is that uh, if it's a design build, there is a possibility of combining uh, design right away and construction. I was wondering whether there are some considerations to apply the same consideration for design bit build or um, it's not being considered in general. Thank you. So I'm not sure. Sure, I understand your question in particular. Are you saying do we do you <laughs> mind restating it maybe? Because I don't I don't think I completely grasp what you're asking. Sure. So um so if it's a design build delivery method, uh we can allocate there is a possibility of you providing us the funds not only for the construction phase of the project, but just a combined amount to include design right away and construction. And however, if it's like a regular uh, delivery method, design bit build, I assume based on the um, guidelines, we can allocate the funds only to the build part of it for the construction. So I was wondering whether there have been any considerations um, to allocate the funds for design right away and construction if the delivery method is design bit build. Um, I'm not aware that there has mm -hmm. been any discussion about that. To my knowledge, this is the first time it's really come up. I didn't hear about it in cycle three or or since then. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will invite Matthew to chime in if he's heard about it before. But as far as I'm aware, there is no policy to change that right now. Design, bid, build, because we only provide funds for construction, we would only allocate for the build portion of that contract. Whereas for design, build or any sequencing, um, we typically will program the funds to the construction component of that project, but the allocation can just be in a combined amount because it includes design right of way and construction. But no matter which version or which delivery method you're using, the SCCP funds will always only be allowed to be utilized for the construction component, that build component. Um, so that's why I don't think I've ever heard yeah. this come up as an issue. But yeah. Naveen, I'll, uh, I agree with everything you're saying, and I think for, for Sona's benefit and for others listening, um, we have a section actually that exists in the 2022 SCCP guidelines. Uh, it's under Section 12, Delivery Methods, and it describes uh, the the use or I guess the um, how, how we would program SCCP funds uh, when the implementing agency is utilizing uh, design, design build, design bid build, CMG, uh, construction manager, general contractor delivery methods. And so uh, I think I think we're saying the same thing. Naveen is correct. We will only program the funds to construction. However, if you utilize one of those delivery methods and you're 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 um, proactive in demonstrating and explaining that in the application, those funds can be used applicably on pre-construction phases. However, it would only 
um, fit within those delivery methods. So I might, for the sake of this conversation, Sona, if, if you haven't um, referred to the existing iteration of the SCCP guidelines, I might turn you to section 12. And if you have additional questions, uh, Naveen and I can certainly uh, have an offline conversation with you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. I was actually looking at the section 12 and just wanted to clarify and for the sake of my understanding, but thank you so much. It's clear now. Appreciate it. Hi, Naveen. We do have one written question and a hand raised, so I'll go ahead and go to the written question right now. This is from Hina. Follow up for scoring criteria or project prioritization for CMCP. Is community input also scored within the CMCP? Do the guidelines identify any metrics for community input and how was that reflected within CMCPs? So I'll, I'll take that in two tiers. Thanks, Kayla. And thanks, Hannah, for that question. So community engagement is a evaluated criteria. Um, and as far as the scoring, it is rated uh, within the application itself. So I think it's criteria number three in the 2022 guidelines is community engagement. And then you said, do the guidelines identify any metrics for community input and how that is reflected? Yes, they do. Community engagement specifically identifies three items for you to consider, which is document the procedures by which the mobility needs of disadvantaged or historically impacted and marginalized communities are identified and considered within the planning process. Identify how the project engaged those communities to consider community identified project needs. And if there are disadvantaged or historically impacted and marginalized communities within the project area, how were they engaged? How was their received input incorporated into the project? Um, and then you provide a demographic map or profile of the impacted areas. Um, in addition to that, we also provide you with the SB1 Competitive Programs Transportation Equity Supplement or just Equity Supplement for short. In the 2022 guidelines, that was Appendix E. Um, it provides you a sample list of indicators that you can use to bolster your response for this particular criterion. Um, and then you can also identify how your agency developed the project scope and how you demonstrated that partnership, engagement, and collaboration with those disadvantaged communities. Um, we will be, uh, this is a great lead off also to go back to what I said earlier in my presentation, we will be advancing equity considerations in the 2024 uh, SECP guidelines, and we will be hosting a standalone all SB1 program workshop to have specific discussions about equity and community engagement um, and how they will evolve in the 2024 guidelines for all three programs. Hopefully that answers your question, Hina. If you have a follow-up, please let me know. And Kayla, any so other the, questions? Yeah, I see that Louis Southstand is raised. Louis, hopefully you can speak now. Yeah, I, this is uh, Louis Zhao. So I, I had uh, one quick question. I know there was uh, sort of a debrief session or debrief workshop after the 2022 um, program concluded. Uh, we had some conversations about some of the performance measures and inconsistencies between the PPR, the, uh, I think, performance measure sheets were required to submit. And I think this is more so on the SCCP and LPP. Do, do you know if there's any effort to uh, make sure that all those items are consistent? I think the one that we brought up specifically was the serious injuries per 100 million VMT. Um, there was just different names or, or it may just be phrasing and how everyone's phrasing things, but the CTC is using rate of serious injuries per 100 million VMT Caltrans is just using fatalities per hundred million VMT um, in the PPR. So we had a we were struggling with how to respond to both of those because they're two different things. Okay, so thanks for your question, Lewis. So I'll address that. So Lewis is talking about the electronic project programming request, known as an EPPR, versus the information provided in the performance indicators and measures using the performance metrics guidebook. In the performance metrics guidebook that's like developed by the commission, um, and Hannah Walter was instrumental in pulling the updated guidebook together for last cycle. Um, if you go into that and you look at the second page, 
um, under safety, you will see that there is a metric called rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, VMT for short. And then and you will see number of serious injuries. And then under that, you will also see rate of serious injuries per 100 million VMT uh, vehicle miles traveled. So I think, Lewis, if I understand your question, question correctly, you're saying that we're asking for those two items separately, whereas Caltrans's EPPR document asks for just one, which is rate of fatalities, which encompasses serious injuries as well? I, I'm not certain <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> uh, I'm not the expert on this. We actually had uh, a modeler pull this together for us, but uh, you know, they indicated that it's two different things. Um, so for us, it's it was a matter of which one we use. And, and, and that's could... why that's why they're they're separated out in the performance okay. metrics guidebook. Again, the performance metrics guidebook, like the table that we've provided, you can use it, um, and you can use your own modeling system if you'd like, or you can use Caltrans's CalBC model. Um, that's kind of up to you. But I, as I recall briefly from the discussion like two years ago, so I apologize if I'm misstating anything. And Matthew or Kayla chime in if you recall the reason why they were separated out as a rate of fatalities and rate of serious injuries is because like you said, Lewis, they are two different things and we wanted to capture them um, because I think that was part of the stakeholder feedback we've received in the previous cycle before that. But I'm gonna pause there and see if maybe Matthew or, or Kayla have anything to add. Yeah, and Lewis, you bring up a really good question and I think it's one that we might, um we might consider having a, a separate conversation on, and we could even loop in our partners at Caltrans who worked with us to develop the performance metrics guidebook and, and also work with us in developing um, the EPPR system and, you know, how, how that information faces the public and, and can be dropped in. The one thing I want to um, make clear to everybody on the call is that we don't take the the outputs from the EPPR, like the performance metrics uh, kind of table that, that's generated um, and drop it into some tool that, that we use to treat each of those values uh, to some you know, screen or anything. We, we, we look at each value qu uh, qualitatively, meaning we're actually gonna go through each one and you know, assess it uh, uh, I guess individually. So if there's a if there's a metric that you feel isn't being accurately portrayed in the performance metrics guidebook, um, you know you can certainly qualify the the disparity or or qualify the difference uh, within the EPPR. I believe there's like an open notes section, and we read all those notes as well. So um, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say is if you feel like uh, the information you're trying to input is being asked for in an awkward way or maybe inconsistently, you can you can qualify that in writing and, and we'll catch that. It's not like we're just going to drop those outputs into a database and compare all projects against one another. I mean, we we eventually do that, uh, but after we've already gone every through everything individually uh, through our evaluation teams and, and had a discussion about it. So hopefully that kind of addresses, you know, any any situations where there might be confusion, um, you know, when using the the performance metrics guidebook and how you drop those uh, values into the EPPR, uh, but we can certainly, I, I would certainly like to address, you know, if 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 it's not just your organization, Lewis, or if it's others that that have similar um, thoughts, we can, you know, that's something that we work closely with uh, our Caltrans colleagues on. Um, on the kind of system side to to make sure that we're 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 capturing things accurately. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I have another quick one too. Um, I I vaguely remember this was like what a year almost two years ago. I vaguely remember requiring to do we were had to do public records requests to get data to respond to some of the performance measures. Is that something that's still going to be required, or is there going to be a simplified way to to kind of get data from Caltrans in the commission? Um, I think it was specific to the safety question. Um, we had to put in a, uh, a PRA form. And then there was another one that was really the transit level of transit delay may have been the other one. Sure. That we were are, so 
So I I can tell you I don't think that the commission has uh okay. you know has has that information and I can tell you if we did we wouldn't require the PRA process but uh I don't want to I I can certainly not supersede Caltrans protocols for the information that they you know develop and and pu public publicize versus you know what processes they they want to go through so so Lewis I might um that sounds like a good question for district 12 uh okay. and or or headquarters but if you know yeah i i don't want to step on any toes uh for our caltrans colleagues and 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 tell you you should have access to something that would violate uh you know maybe their um proprietary information okay thanks thanks matthew thanks lewis any other questions? This is really great. I'm glad folks are bringing up items for discussion. Hi, Naveen. I'm not seeing any more hands raised or questions asked at the moment. All right. Um, feel free to think on it and linger. I'm going to move ahead to the next slide. Um, but again, does not preclude you from asking questions or commenting uh, in the Q&A box, uh, feel free to do so. As a reminder, the poll is still live. If you have not responded to the poll, um, but would like to, you can just go under more in your webinar, click polls. Um, it should pop it up and you should be able to respond to it. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Again, we're not going to do anything with that data. It's not scary. It's just to give us an idea about where you're at in terms of participating with this program. Um, it's just a general musing curiosity, if you will. So I appreciate all those who have participated in the poll, and I hope everybody who hasn't will choose to do so um, if they're willing to do so. Anyway, uh, on the current slide, oh, wait, before I dive in, uh, Kayla, I think there's a question. Yes, this is from Marvin Norman. Will these updated guidelines include mechanisms to evaluate how projects would impact VMT reduction goals? Uh, I think we already do that in SCCP. We, so se section 17.1 under, so part four evaluation under seven sec, under 17.1 congestion evaluation criteria, we do already ask applicants to identify the extent of congestion in the corridor. If it's, if the project will reduce VMT, again, vehicle miles traveled, how is the solution balancing transportation environment and community, why it's the most beneficial improvement in the corridor. So all of that is already included within these guidelines. Um, that said, I will go back to my previous statement and say, if there is something that you would like to see added into the guidelines, any examples that you have that you think would be helpful to provide as maybe a sample response there or something, feel free to share them with us. But we do already include vehicle miles traveled. Um, and there is already a uh, mechanism to evaluate the project would impact reduction goals that's included in the performance metrics guidebook. You may use any any type of modeling um, tool that's available to you, but there's also the Caltrans CalBC sketch model that you can utilize to respond to that criteria. Hopefully that answers your question, Marvin. If it doesn't, feel free to follow up and let me know. So on this slide, you will see office hours. You may have seen our announcement in your inboxes, but we are happy to yet again announce that SB1 programs virtual office hours have returned, yay. Uh, we have begun scheduling office hours. So if you have not requested a session as of yet, please do so at your earliest convenience. These sessions are reserved on a first come first serve basis and do tend to fill up fairly quickly. We would like to accommodate as many interested participants as possible, but please understand that participating in the office hours sessions does not guarantee that a proposed project will be recommended for funding. These are uh, technical assistance sessions. These are discussion and engagement sessions. We're happy to provide responses to questions, um, and that's what we do. It's a one-on-one -on -one time with us to answer questions about your specific projects or the application process at large. I have embedded a link to the request form on this slide, but it is also available on the program webpage and uh, is accessible all hours of the day, 24 seven, and sessions will begin in March and conclude in May. Uh, I've talked a lot about these virtual office hour sessions and they are endorsed by our very own Kenny Cow. 
And um, at this time, I would like to take any questions that you may have um, or respond to any comments. Ah, Sarkis. Sarkis, you should be able to speak now. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sarkis. Good morning, Levine. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't say anything earlier, but uh, is a, an awardee of the, the program definitely supports the uh, office hours uh, and having that opportunity to work with CTC and project partners on application development. But I think that um, I'd also recommend maybe looking at prior uh, application you know, lists that are available for applicants just to see what has been approved by the CTC. Obviously, this is a multi-little program, but looking towards um, zero emission vehicle charging and active transportation improvements to help benefit uh, getting people out of the cars. I definitely recommend that. Um, also, just wanted to thank you for your leadership on the, the program. Um, you know, we've been working on these program guidelines for a while now. And like you said, the last cycle was um, a big update and, you know, your ability to work with stakeholders and project partners to make sure that we're delivering on commitments to the state. Um, it, you just make our lives so much easier, so we're thankful for that. Oh, Sarkis, thank you so much for that comment. And Sarkis is correct. There are so many great projects that have been awarded in the past cycles of the program. By all means, your, your projects do not have to duplicate what has already been done or, or match those projects closely or directly, but those are great projects. And like um, Sona also said earlier, those fact sheets are available um, as samples for you to refer to, to just kind of see what other applicants have done in previous cycles and take heed from your, from your peers um, in the transportation industry. And as always, like Sarkis said, we are always, always available to respond to any questions um, or comments you may have. If you have any feedback on improvement, we take those comments and that feedback very seriously. And we try to meet all of you where you are at. Um, we understand that it is a bit of a transportation renaissance period right now. And there's a lot going on, a lot of changes, lots of updates. Um, and with that come brand new challenges. And we're trying to meet our stakeholders where they're at as much as possible. So we really appreciate the positive feedback, but we also appreciate any deltas that you are willing to offer us uh, always helps us improve. And we have partners like Sarkis and Kenny and Sona uh, and Marvin and all the people who've spoken up today to help us along with that. So thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. Hi, Naveen, I'm not seeing any more hands raised or questions at the moment. Okay, then I will move on to the next slide. These are some topics we plan to share in the upcoming workshops, draft program guidelines, frequently asked questions from past cycles, and we may even host a potential open office hour session again. This was also popular last cycle when we converted one of our Solutions for Congested Corridors program workshops into an open office hour sessions. Uh, participants were able to drop by at their convenience and ask us general questions about the guidelines or discuss their project proposals, because we understand that not everybody needs a formal 30 minute to one hour office hour session with us. Sometimes it's a five minute question that they just want to drop by and ask. So I think that's why it was so popular last year. Um, as you can see, the key topics for subsequent workshop slide is very tiny. It only has three bullets on it. And it's because we have heard your feedback about major overhauls and we are not making or any suggestions for any major overhauls. The only thing that we're really going to focus on updating is what I shared with you earlier. And those are going to be more incremental changes um, and not major ones that will hopefully not require you to overhaul any of your process and the application um, process as well. So that said, are there any topics that you want us to cover? And if so, feel free to chime in, raise your hand or comment and provide some feedback. Kayla, any questions? Yeah, I see Sana's hand raised. Sana, you should be able to speak. Thank you. So this is my first time managing the SCCP grant and 
Um, I'm actually interested whether you're open to provide any feedback on previously submitted uh, projects that were not awarded during office hours session, just in case uh, we find the necessity to put this project as a candidate project for the upcoming cycle. Yeah, sure. So I think projects, we, we shared this a little bit during our staff recommendations phase as well. So I'll, I'll go over it a little bit generally now. Uh, Sona, thank you for your question. Uh, projects that are not recommended for funding from past cycles, in my experience, because last cycle was my first experience as program manager running the program, I, I found that they were or not me alone, <laughs> our evaluators, including myself, found that um, they were less competitive for a variety of reasons, including projects did not meet the main objective of the program, they were not in compliance with program guidelines, or some of the required information that was included in the criterion or criteria were missing or unclear, projects were not ready for construction, um, in the time frame that was provided for the funding phase of the fiscal years of the program. And the project did not meet state climate goals or utilize multimodal solutions and so on and so forth. Um, we are happy to discuss, we actually did meet with every single agency that wanted to meet to have a debrief session when they were not effective in getting awarded or programmed funds in last cycle. And we had great conversations with them. A lot of the feedback came from them as well on what we could do to improve in addition to the people who were successful. But um, that, that said, I would like to caveat and say this thing for SCCP in particular. We only have $500 million for a two-year cycle to award. And in SCCP, because we only fund capital projects, um, and only fund the construction phase, we typically receive applications with projects that are really, really huge. Like these are big projects across the state. Even, even the ones in smaller localities tend to be like major lifts for those localities, for those regions. So they tend to not just be one project, they are a project that encompasses many different components underneath it. And each of those components in itself is a standalone project with independent utility in addition to the whole project itself. So that makes it a little bit more competitive as a program to compete in because everybody brings their A game. And if everybody is competing like up here, it becomes really complicated to say, oh, you didn't get funding because you just didn't do a good job. That's not really it. It's just based on the information that was provided, based on how you told your story, essentially. This is one of our managers who used to work here before, Christine. She used to say this. It's how do you tell your story? How do you tell us all the great things that your project is going to do for you? It ends up being more about how you talk about it and how you demonstrate how great your project is versus whether or not the project is good itself or not. And I think last cycle especially, Everybody brought their A game. Everybody did the best that they could with what they had. We had, like Sarkis said, we had some major overhauls to the guidelines last year. So they had those challenges. Um, and everybody provided really good information about community engagement, about equity. They factored in information about pro-housing and land efficiency. So it is le a lengthy process and it is difficult and everybody will do it their own way. We do offer that flexibility. We don't tie you down to very specific constraints on how you respond to the criteria. We just provide guiding questions and examples. Um, but that said, it's there's no one clear answer to that, Sona, about how like a magical solution for how you will win out over above others. It's just, it's competitive. Everybody comes with their A game and comes to play. And some people get like, for example, there were people who competed in cycle one, but weren't awarded until cycle two or cycle three. So it just depends on what your project is and how you're telling your story. Hopefully that answers your question and let me know if you have any follow-ups. Nick, Naveen, I'm, I'm, I agree with everything you said. I might add one additional thought if I wanted to take Sona's converse, uh, question in a different direction. So Sona, it sounds like you're the new grant manager for SCCP at Metro. Um, and if Metro is interested in submitting projects that have already been submitted by Metro and were unsuccessful, uh, we're more than happy to talk about those projects again and debrief past uh, evaluation processes of those projects again 
in the office hour sessions. Um, I, I will go so far as to say we would prefer only to discuss projects that were unsuccessful with agencies that submitted those projects. So for instance, if you wanted to talk about a project that was unsuccessful from another organization or another region, um, we likely would not get into the specifics of our evaluation of that project for the purpose of, um, you know, we want to maintain the privacy of the organizations that didn't uh, didn't compete well because you never know if they're going to bring those projects back again with with a, a second look or maybe a different consideration. So um, given what Naveen said, if if Metro is interested in resubmitting old projects that were not successful in the past, we're, we're more than happy to talk through why it wasn't successful and how it can be successful uh, again. Thank you, Matthew. And I was actually asking only about Metro submitted projects in previous cycles. I don't have a short list yet, but in case we um, do more research and um, to come, up, come up with various ideas and include uh, those previously submitted and not award projects in our short list for office hours, that would be only the case. But thank you so much, both. Um, that was very helpful. Good, yeah, and and it uh, it will help Naveen a lot if uh, that type of information is provided when you request office hours. Um, I know we ask for a list of the projects, but I I think if you know if if you are seeking you know information from past evaluations uh, as well as talking about the project you're proposing, that that will equip her uh, with you know a, an ability to do a little bit of uh, kind of pre-work to, to bring to the conversation. We'll certainly do, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so no, there's no no pressure to bring a very specific list of projects. It's totally okay if you wanna use the virtual office hour to talk more generally about the application process as well. I understand you're a newer grant manager and this is, this is your first time working on it. So I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about some of those aspects of the application process as well, if that would be more helpful to you, if you don't have a short list of projects available by the time we meet. So I know you and I have talked a little bit offline about this as well, but please know we're happy to meet you where you're at. So um, looking forward to our discussion later on. Thank you, Nadine. Yeah. Any other questions or, or thoughts or any feedback or a joke or a limerick that anybody wants to really share? Hi, Naveen. I'm not seeing any hands raised or written questions or comments right now. All right, then I will move it along to closing. Quick recap. We discussed the program, past cycles, lessons learned from cycle three specifically. We shared the proposed 2024 program schedule and timeline, the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans, courtesy of Bridget Driller, which was amazing, and addressed stakeholder feedback that will inform revisions to this cycle's guidelines. We also just discussed office hours and key topics for subsequent workshops. Um, and that is pretty much all that we covered in today's workshop. And because I'm a chatty Kathy, I have found a way to uh, fill the two hours that this meeting was scheduled for almost. It's 1130, which means you have lots and lots of time to ask questions, make comments, um, and maybe share that joke or limerick if you've been sitting on it or a harrowing journey story. Uh, whatever you want to talk about, we're, we've still got about half an hour left in this workshop. Happy to talk about anything. It does not have to be about the material that was covered directly today. If you have something from the past guidelines or you're looking at guidelines right now and you have questions about them, feel free to chime in and talk about them. We've addressed several of those types of questions today as well. So feel free to raise your hand, pop a question in in the Q&A section and we can talk about it. But I will say we will email to save the date for the next SB1 programs workshop soon. So please keep an eye out for that announcement. Um, I don't think there are too many action items that have been resulting from here. I invite Ben to chime in if there are, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected. Um, but I do think, Kayla, do we have any questions or any raised hands at this time? Uh, we received a joke in, in the questions tab for everyone. Um, so Anonymous asked, what do you call a cow with only two legs? lean beef. <laughs> wow. You know what? I'll raise you one. I will say 
What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. Ha ha. Uh, super dorky jokes, but I'm all for them. I love this kind of humor. Um, judge me if you will. Uh, but it brings, <laughs> see, it makes you smile. Kayla's smiling. <laughs> um, I don't see anything else, Naveen. Um, no hands raised. Just some jokes rolling in, but I'm going to go ahead and, and give people their time back and not read those right now. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do want to know the answer to angels. It says, why Angel Pyle asks, why do dads carry a spare sock when golfing? Because they may get a hole in one. <laughs> that was a good one, Angel. <laughs> uh, and one from our esteemed leader, Matthew Yaska. What musical genre are national anthems? Country. <laughs> And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to move us to contact us. Our contact information is provided here and is also available on the commission's website. I have also embedded links that redirect to the SB1 programs and the Solutions for Congested Corridors program webpages for your convenience. Feel free to contact us with any questions or comments at any time. We are here to help you as best as we can. And if we can't answer a question, we will make it our executive leadership's problem. That's how we do. Okay, so on to the next one last quest call for questions or comments, just to make sure nobody has anything for CMCPs maybe or anything like that. I'm not seeing anything to be in. Excellent. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us today. I know it's a Friday and people have a lot to do to get through and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule for be and for being here today. You've been an excellent captive audience, but also great participants in discussion. These workshops are only as effective as the people who participate in them and you are always an exceptional group. I hope you enjoy a restful weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Ben, for all your help and your assistance and we'll see you all at the next one. Oh, I do see one question just came in right at the end. Kayla, do you want to go ahead and read it out? Yeah, thanks, Naveen. Is there going to be a continued, sorry, let me start this over. Is there going to be continued spending on highway widening projects that increase BMT? That is a good question. And the answer is, I have no idea. It really just depends on the types of projects that are submitted uh, for evaluation we go through a rigorous evaluation process with um, staff from Caltrans and the California Transportation Commission coming in. And, um, you know, it just really depends on the evaluation process. We, I will say, I will echo Ma Matthew's comment from a previous workshop here. We cannot preclude uh, widening projects from the Solutions for Congested Corridors program because um, we do have statutory requirements that we have to adhere to. And so we do try to follow the letter and the intent of our program, um, the statutory intent of our program. But, um, you know, it really just depends how they do in the evaluation portion. Uh, I will say based on last cycle's, um, last cycle's competitors and the awardees, uh, the most successful types of projects are going to be the ones that are multimodal. They offer much more than one type of mode or solution. That is not to say that I'm precluding anyone who only has one mode that they're putting up for competition, but those were the most successful applications. I think almost we had 10 total awarded projects last cycle, and of those 10, at least seven or eight of them are multimodal projects incorporating active transportation solutions, transit and rail solutions, uh, complete street solutions. Um, so they're not just one thing by themselves. And Naveen, I... you, you answered that very well. Um, the only piece I wanna add is I think an emphasis on the statutory component, uh, because that's a, you know, th that's a question I know we're gonna get a lot. Um, and I think the best way to answer it is we haven't seen cycle four applications yet. Uh, and the statute for the solutions for congested corridors program specifically lists managed lanes as eligible projects. So commission staff and commission uh, recommendations cannot uh, you know, simply omit projects that may uh, induce VMT. Uh, however, as Naveen mentioned, we have mechanisms built into the program to encourage projects to do the opposite of that. Um, and the last thing I want to say is general purpose lanes are prohibited from competing in this program. So 
that's a significant distinction. Um, the, the lanes would have to be managed. So either high occupancy vehicle, uh, told or express. So, uh, but yes, I, it, it's a good question. It's one I know we're going to continue to get. Um, and, and, and we're, we, we believe that we've crafted guidelines in, in the best way to, uh, to take this program in a direction as we statutorily can. Yeah, and Naveen, so um, we actually have received a, a few more comments and questions in on this topic. Yes. Um, so first from Stephanie Hugh, related to that, what about funding managed lane projects and their VMT mitigation strategies and the ongoing annual cost to facilitate the VMT strategies? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a statement or a question. I, I guess my, my question is, what about them specifically? Are, are we going to fund them? If the question is related to if we're planning to fund them, it goes back to Matthew's response where we'll see when we get to cycle for applications. Again, we can't preclude them from it, but um, we did ask that VMT mitigation strategies to be included as part of section 17.1 under congestion evaluation criteria. So Again, it's a qualitative analysis for evaluators to go through. We have uh, program experts and staff from Caltrans and the commission who evaluate each of the projects that come in. Um, and that's one of those things that we look at very closely when we're evaluating those projects. So it really just depends when we get to the evaluation component. Thanks, Naveen. Stephanie clarified and said yes to fund them. That's what she was meaning. And then I think, Kayla, right now, I, I do see a couple of questions, and I will plan to respond to them over email. But yeah, I, I think that's it for time. now. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. Then I think we're good to go. If there are any other questions or anything that anybody thinks of after the fact, please feel free to let us know. Um, I will say... Uh, before we log off, because it's an uh, it's a funny joke, I will read out Deborah Redman's joke that she just contributed. A priest, a rabbit, and a minister walk into a bar. The bartender asks the rabbit, what'll you have? The rabbit says, I don't know. I'm only here because of autocorrect. <laughs> okay. Thank you for indulging me, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a restful weekend and take care and be safe. And we'll see you at the next workshop. Mm -hmm. Naveen, just really quick, just for the sake of transparency, uh, the, we did get a couple questions that we will respond to offline, but I want to characterize uh, the nature of them. So it's additional questions about pushing projects uh, to increase the percentage of funding on the multimodal aspects um, and ensuring that managed lanes don't increase capacity uh, concurrent or parallel to general purpose lanes. Um, Again, I would encourage I would encourage you to look at the guidelines we currently have written um, and look at the program of projects that we've funded in cycle three. Uh, you'll notice that all of the projects in cycle three, uh, except for maybe a couple, uh, were 100% funding alternate modes of transportation off the state highway system. Uh, so I would I would I would say that we have figured out a way to encourage percentages of funds. Uh, to go towards m the alternate modes of, of travel in this program. And regarding uh, increasing capacity in concurrent or parallel general purpose lanes, um, I, that's kind of a tough question to answer. Um, you know, we there was a project in cycle one that, that came very close to blurring that line. It was deemed ineligible. So to answer that question, I would say if there's any uh, concern that a general purpose lane is also being built uh, adjacent to an eligible lane, that the instance that we had that project submitted, uh, that project was deemed ineligible. Now for existing general purpose lanes, uh, obviously a majority of the highway system uh, in the state of California is, is general purpose lane. So uh, we, again, within the, the statutory confines of this program, uh, we are very specific about only funding managed lanes when those lanes are considered and deemed competitive. So, um, but we can, 
take those questions offline and have a separate conversation. Just wanted to uh, assure the group that, uh, you know, we're considering all of this in the space of this uh, conversation. Thanks, Matthew. Um, seeing no other questions or hands raised, I think third time is the charm. I am going to go ahead and thank you all again for joining us and thank you for all the feedback that you've offered. I hope you enjoy a restful weekend and thank you to our team, Matthew, Kayla, Ben for being here and Bridget especially for joining in and giving us um, all those details on the CMCPs. We'll see you at the next one.